Once again, um, please join me in, in, in welcoming Werner Herzog to the Pollock Theater. And let's get going with some questions, because I know you'll have some of your own. Um, your film is a homage to Murnau's classic and aimed explicitly to affirm a bond between uh, Weimar and new German cinema. Can you tell us why you decided to bring this particular Murnau film back to life, so to speak? Well, it's not so much Weimar. I don't care much about that, but uh, the uh, young German filmmakers in the 60s uh, had no father generations with whom we could connect. They were either in exile or they perished in concentration camps or uh, they sided with the uh, Nazi ideology and created films for, for the Third Reich. So <clears throat> we, we had no, no one who would somehow uh, build a bridge to German film culture. So it was more the, the generation of the grandfathers that uh, was important for us, or in particular for me. And since I did uh, Nosferatu as an homage to Murnau, I felt like uh, having reached solid ground, like crossing a, a river with murky waters and treacherous eddies, and all of a sudden there was a feeling of, of being safe. And, and of course, uh, there was this kind of deficit. Uh, uh, Nosferatu probably was my 20th film. Uh, maybe, I, it's hard for me to count, but uh, it, it was not, an, uh, not one of the very early ones. Right, right. Well, let's talk a little bit. Uh, we talked this afternoon, I'm sorry some of you missed that, about significant differences between Bram Stoker's da Dracula and Murnau's film. So, for instance, where Stoker's novel evokes Jack the Ripper, who operated in London in the mm -hmm. 1880s, Murnau's film conjures up the medieval Europe of uh, the plague. But what comes into view in Stoker's original Dracula, as much as Murnau's film, is Western Europe's relationship to Eastern Europe. Uh, the Slav people in general, and those of the Bar Balkans in particular, a world the West had for centuries studied with fas uh, fascinated antipathy. How did you view the vampire figure and the theme of contagion in your film? Because I think it does operate yeah. differently. Well, sure, but it's a little bit too complex how you're asking. Mm -hmm. uh, my relationship to uh, Bram Stoker has been uh, very easy to decipher. I don't like his book very much. I think it's, <laughs> it's very mediocre literature. However, there are certain things, and it doesn't have so much with uh, 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 juxtaposition of Germanic people in Slavic or whatever, in gypsies in my film. There are gypsies who actually, I think, spoke Roma. I never knew what they said. I just asked them to, to say some sort of text, more or less what, what I wanted them to say, but I never had a, a translation. So it's not that uh, what impressed me about uh, Bram Stoker, about his Dracula, is that uh, we have permanent, constant use of means of communication. They communicate through uh, Edison cylinders. They speak messages and send these messages out. They use a telephone. I mean, the early telephones, uh, the very prototypes of telephones, the very prototypes of telegrams, very, no, telegram was, uh, was longer in use already. But it's a, it's a permanent uh, use of means of communication in a way. It's almost like predicting or foreseeing a communication age. Mm -hmm. And out of using these uh, instruments of communications comes a very a deep darkness and a deep solitude. It's very much about solitudes and that's uh, a strange and strong side about uh, uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula. Of course, uh, Murnau stole uh, from him and had trouble with copyright. Mm -hmm. That's why he had to name it Nosferatu and Count Orlok in his case, and, um, and, and he used different names. And the funny thing is that when, when I made my, started to make my film, the Murnau Foundation, who owns now the rights of the film, wanted to charge me copyright, and I said, Murnau himself stole it and got in trouble yeah. and couldn't show the film. So I'm a thief, thief without loot, yeah. face it. And then later, uh, not very long ago, 10 years ago, 
somebody, a real, real pig, bought, uh, got in cahoots with the heirs of Galen, the screenwriter, yeah. and wanted to charge me uh, uh, decades later for using the screenplay by Galen. And of course, when you look at the screenplay of Galen in my film, there are such fundamental dis differences that there was no chance. And I said, sue me, uh, try it, good luck to you, you will fail. And they didn't sue me. So I, I cannot be intimidated easily. It is wonderful irony. Yeah. No, uh, it's not irony. It's just straightforward. Uh, Agree. Uh, lower. No, I. I would lower my head and charge. <laughs> Your film was released in two language versions: a German language version and an English language version. Not unlike the practice that was common in the early late 1920s and early 30s. Um, when the coming of sound initiated a short run but significant process of producing foreign language versions of the same film. I've read that you consider the German language film to be the most authentic as opposed to the English version seen more widely by audiences at the time, I believe. But yeah. could you tell us why you think the German version is more authentic? We didn't see that. Because it, it has to do with uh, my culture and the culture of most of the actors except uh, Isabel Arjani, who spoke uh, no German. She would speak French and English, so sometimes she would speak English, but uh, in many occasions, and I had to do an English version because at that time, 20th Century Fox uh, was very fond of me and they wanted to have a three pictures deal with me, uh, Nosferatu, Wojciech and Fitzcarraldo. <clears throat> and I, I had my doubts that this uh, deal, whatever function, of course it functioned with Nosferatu, but uh, and, and they didn't produce it. They only gave an advance guarantee. Today they claim that they produced it. It's not true. If, they, if anybody tells you that, it's a lie. Um, and it wasn't that much money either. It was something like 25 percent of the finances, all the rest I had to, mm -hmm. to raise myself and the French were in it, who were even worse uh, than uh, 20th century Fox. And, uh, and then it came to discussing Fitzcarraldo and it was kind of odd because uh, I was invited to a session where all the big shots of 20th century Fox and their legal counsels were there. And, and they wanted me to explain how I would do the film. I said, yeah, I know the Peruvian jungle and I'm gonna do it there. Uh, and they said, yeah, but uh, that's bad jungle. And I asked gentlemen, what's a good jungle then? <laughs> and they proposed uh, the Botanic Garden in San Diego. <laughs> and and when, it, when it came to moving a ship over the mountain, and it's a big one, it's really huge. Uh, and they said, how are you going to move it over a mountain? And I explained how I would do it without uh, m much modern technology like Stone Age people. And they immediately proposed what I later called the plastic solution. Why don't we build a plastic replica, something like uh, 10 feet long and move it over a studio hill or over a hill in the <laughs> botanic garden? And I said, that's not how it's going to happen. And they said Werner to me. But all of a sudden, they were kind of frosty and called me Mr. Herzog from a certain point in the discourse. And I, I knew I was going to be alone. And uh, concerning 20th Century Fox, I, I knew I was going to be alone. And the real cultural nexus would be uh, my, my own culture. Yeah, makes sense. And that's what you saw tonight. And by the way, the English version, some uh, scholars have figured out, yeah, there's tiny little things, uh, I think f 50 seconds, bit, a few bits are tiny, different or shorter in the English version. I do not recall. And I think it didn't damage the film. No, no and that kind of analysis doesn't the, sound that interesting. The English either. version doesn't yeah. damage the movie. Um, your collaborations with Florian Fricke and Popovo extend beyond Nosferatu to a handful of films. With Fricke in his capacity both as um, actor and a musician and a composer, can you talk about how your work with him over many years resulted in this soundtrack? Um, 
and what was the desire? What were the desired effects for the soundtrack? And what was your collaborative process uh, with Fricka? Uh, well, there's a couple of layers of questioning. Uh, my relationship uh, was uh, number one friendship, and I I really respected him very deeply, and I admired him as a musician. Uh, and and we would uh, sometimes. Uh, sit together and listen to things that he had composed and recorded and I said there's something which sounds right but uh, let's have a version of that that has a much bigger crescendo and has different instrumentation and so so we, we were very uh, very much into technical things mm -hmm. but but otherwise how shall I say and, and as an actor well he I, I put him in uh, two films one is Signs of Life, my first long film, where he plays a, a pianist. And in Caspar Hauser, he also plays a pianist, a, a blind pianist. Um, and he had this kind of angelic sort of looks to him. Uh, however, he, he could be really mean and vicious. We would play soccer and, and he, he could play really foul. I mean, he... <laughs> He, he would hit me hard and, and in, a, in a surreptitious way the referee wouldn't see it. <laughs> and uh, so we, we had some, some uh, we sorted it out in, in the parking lot later on <laughs> after the game. So that was the other side, but, but we loved each other and uh, I'm uh, very sad that he uh, didn't uh, live very long. Although I told him when he was uh, 25, as I said to him, Florian, uh, you must die young. You should, you should not undergo the indignity of age, of old age. You are the one who needs to die young. He actually died at middle age or so. Mm -hmm. And uh, I regret that I said that to him, how stupid. Uh, mm -hmm. I didn't know that he would die young. Or fairly young, and um, so I'm very fond of him, and I owe him a lot. Mm. And he um, was one of my finest collaborators. Could you tell us a little bit more about the production process? Um, what was your biggest challenge in making the film? Why did you choose to film in the town of Delft? And what can you tell us about Ten Thousand Rats? Well, again, a couple of questions. Uh, I, I <laughs> we always, can skip, we could go right yeah, to the I, rats. I liked, I liked the city of Delft a lot, although uh, there was a fraction against us of, of people who said uh, we have a rat problem for a long time, which we somehow managed now, and now there is somebody with uh, 10,000 rats. But I, I had plans where, I mean, full, absolutely foolproof plans in fact, we didn't lose a single rat, not one. Uh, but, but it was a very elaborate system and I don't want to go into details. And, uh, and there were people who, uh, we had the rats uh, in, a, in a huge barn outside of, of town and uh, there was trouble because the person who was uh, supposed to pay the farmers for buying the food for the rats didn't deliver the money and kept it for himself. So. The farmers were enraged and I had a battle with them and they came with a big caterpillar when we, when we took the rats and, and with this huge shovel went straight into the wind, windshield of our truck. So and, and there, there, was, there was a real, real, real significant battle and police came and they blocked the, the causeway. I actually with four or five team members rolled one of the police cars into the ditch. So police was unfriendly with me and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and on and on and, and in this, when you see the empty, the empty place, the big town square mm -hmm. and, and at the end is the is town hall, a very beautiful building. And I actually retaliated at the end, I, I took revenge I mean really nasty with butter acid. That's my weapon of choice in such cases. It makes a place, if, if I had it here, 
with a syringe and so and it would spray it around like a skunk. You couldn't see a film for two years. It's so bad. Yeah. No, you have to, you see, when, when, you're, when you're making a film, or if you're uh, an artist, the natural enemy that comes up, for the first enemy is always bureaucracy. And, and you, have to, you have to deal with bureaucracy. Uh, for example, you have to be capable of misleading them with a forged shooting permit which I've done quite a few times. I would enter, I would enter town hall at five in the morning uh, by picking a lock. Uh, and uh, so as a filmmaker, you have, to, you have to know how to do these things. <laughs> and I actually teach it uh, in my rogue film school, but I keep telling the students what I'm showing to you. It's actually the only things that I teach, all the rest is about a way of life and self-reliance and whatever. I teach them only two things and I get over with it in the first hour. Uh, how to forge documents, how to pick locks. And I tell them, since we are in semi-public, you have to read my face. Read my face. This is how you pick the lock. Uh, but of course you will only uh, forcefully enter into your own office, into your own property, look at my face, <laughs> because you left your passport locked in there and misplaced the key, and you have to take the, the international flight to Europe. You have to get hold of your passport, read my face, you are entering <laughs> your own office, in your own office only. To give them confidence. No, to, uh, to avoid legal trouble that I'm teaching, <laughs> that I'm teaching something, uh, something uh, in, in conspiracy to do something illegal. So tell us about working with Klaus Kinski. Yeah. I think um, you know he's. It's an amazing performance, uh, yeah. and and especially since he would be judged against Max Schreck's incredible performance from in the Murnau film. But it's really quite amazing, and he, and I hope yeah. we talk a little bit later about how he's humanized in a certain way. Or there's something. Well, that was my yeah. my way to do it because in uh, Murnau's film Max Schreck, he's just like an insect. He doesn't, the vampire doesn't have any emotions, doesn't have any soul. I always wanted a vampire different, who um, is deeply uh, agonized by not being capable to um, participate in human things like death or uh, daylight or love mm -hmm. or uh, all sorts of of, of human emotions and human activities. So it's uh, uh, Kinski is a vampire who deeply, uh, who is deeply agonized by not being able to, to love uh, a woman. Mm -hmm. And that was always clear. Of course, Kinski was, as usual, was the ultimate pestilence. Very hard to, to handle him, but that was always uh, the same. We knew that, uh, but Everybody had forgotten how bad he was. And so normally all the other actors would turn against me. How can you do that to us to have such a, such a madman on the set? And my own crew would turn against me. How can you do that to us again? So my argument was always uh, wait until we finish the film. The only thing that counts uh, is what you see on the screen. And it doesn't matter whether we had uh, terrible days together and threats and, uh, uh, and um, unple the, the most unpleasant. I mean, the young Marlon Brando, who everybody knows was the ultimate pestilence, was only, was only kindergarten against, <laughs> against Kinski. Yeah. yeah. So while this is a horror film, and I think everybody felt it in the audience, it's also humorous in many instances, sure, especially yeah. when 
Jonathan, well, not only, but especially when Jonathan first uh, dines with the vampire in his castle. So what would you say about the relationship between humor and terror in this film? I wouldn't say it, humor and terror. Uh, pretty much all my films have a, have a good amount of humor in it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and even in some films where you, where you know you shouldn't even contemplate laughing, where you, where you bite your own tongue and you laugh like even dwarfs started small. It's a film which is uh, really the gloomiest of gloom and, and terrifying and anarchic and destructive. And people laugh and I'm glad that they laugh because it's so surreal and so, uh, so crazed. Uh, Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's not a normal humor as you would have it in an Eddie Murphy movie. It's a different type, uh, a strange dark humor that I c cannot really explain to myself easily, but I, um, I think I have it in me uh, to, to have some very funny stuff. Yeah. You see it in the Bad Lieutenant. I mean, people laugh more, people laugh more than in an Eddie Murphy film. And I'm glad about that. Uh, it's strange because everything, everybody believes uh, uh, that I'm, I'm this kind of gloomy, dark, uh, doomsday saying, uh, uh, Teutonic filmmaker. Number one, I'm not Teutonic, I'm Bavarian. And number two, <laughs> and number two uh, there's a lot of humor in almost all my films. Yeah, one of the things we're trying to really bring home in the series is that you know, uh, Weimar cinema, new German cinema is not all dark. That, that humor is very much a part of the tradition. And I think there's some in small ways, that even the Renfield character, where he's crazy, of course, and yeah. at first, you know, his hysterical laughing, I mean, it's funny, but, and you think, oh my God. But then there's a moment it moves over into something else. Yeah, sure. And, and of course, uh, the, the actor who plays a part of Renfield, he had this strange, crazy laughter in him. Yeah. Roland Topor, a great artist and a, and a, a writer, he, he wrote uh, mm -hmm. uh, for the stage. And I discovered him uh, at a festival uh, and I saw him on a, on a video screen in some corridor and there was a man who said a sentence and then had this, cra after almost every sentence, had this crazy laugh. And I said, who is this, who is this, this is extraordinary. And I met him and it was, turned out, Roland Topor, of whom I knew nothing. But of course, I, I started to like and respect him very deeply. And he had this natural craze mm -hmm. in, in him in a way. So it was not very hard to elicit mm -hmm. this kind of surreal laughter from him. Mm -hmm. he, he had it in him. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think uh, his parents, uh, or he was as a child survivor of a concentration camp, and he said to me, from, from that kind of stuff, that's where I got my laughter from. Mm. <laughs> and I had the feeling, man, yeah, this is, this is a, deep, uh, a, a deep source for, for surreal laughter. And only he is allowed to laugh, no one else. I just want to shift a little bit because I think one of the key differences, and a really interesting difference, and this is 1979, yeah. this is new German cinema, and it's, it's Lucy's role in the film that here is so different, I think, than Murnau's v version or any other version. Um, unlike Nina, or Ellen in Murnau's film, um, Lucy's mm -hmm. emotional integrity and capacity for preserving her imaginative belief in the midst of death and chaos are never diminished. And in fact, it's, it's almost like a woman's got to do what a woman's got to do. I mean, you know, you can't, the scientist, between science yeah. and superstition, she, know, she knows what she needs to do. She has to save the human race. And, um, what, and so she becomes much more active in that scene at the end in the square is really significant, I think. Um, as she's navigating the space herself that we've seen um, Nosferatu himself navigate earlier in the, mm -hmm. in the dark. But she's much more central and much more, um, um, has much more agency, it seems to me, than in... That's true, yeah, I never thought about it, but uh, when I look back at uh, the film, 
which by the way I haven't seen for a quarter of a century. That's why I sat through to understand what the hell did I do at that time. Uh, she, uh, yes, it's true, she's more and more prominent and at the end she, she com completely dominates the film and it's not so in, in Murnau's film, that's correct. It seems, uh, it seems like, you know, that somehow, you know, you are making this film in the late 70s um, and feminism was a pretty potent world force and she becomes this very, as I said, a, a different kind of heroine um, so, yeah, but, it, but I, I don't mean to read but, too but much women, in it, but I did women think... Women were always underrepresented, uh, yep. whether it uh, be the late 70s or, or until today. And this is why I, I welcome uh, uh, filmmakers or actresses in that are newer. For, for example, there's a wonderful film out now, or will be out fairly soon, it's called The Rider a young uh, Chinese-American woman, Chloe Zhao. You should see the film. It's probably going to be released uh, something like uh, March or April next year through Sony Classics. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, almost out of nowhere, there's a young woman who uh, does the definitive film about cowboys and rodeo riders uh, in South Dakota. And she's a woman who... Uh, only spoke Mandarin mm -hmm. growing up in Beijing until she was 10 or 11 and moved to London and then to the United States. So I, I like emerging, emerging women and not in a feminist, not in a way that the feminists would, would welcome them. That's an that's a easy route to, to invite them. Uh, in, in a way, uh, I like the self-made the self-made women who, who just couldn't care less whether there was a male-dominated world around in cinema. Uh, and, and she could never care less about that. And I, I really like that. Same thing with, uh, strangely enough, uh, practically all my films, feature films, and many of my documentaries about uh, men. And only recently, uh, leading central characters, females. But that's uh, almost like a new discovery for me. And I ask myself, uh, well, did I have any stories when I was 22 or so to make a film about mm -hmm. a female character? And my answer is, no, I didn't. Otherwise, I probably would have done it. Mm. Yeah. Well, I guess in remaking this, you know, very classic and still popular film, that seems to be one of the significant changes, that she is this much yeah. more powerful... It's not center. a remake. It's, right. uh, it's uh, as keep, you said it correctly, yeah. it's more an homage right. to Murnau, and uh, it's not uh, a transforming Bram Stoker's novel into a movie, nor is it right. uh, adapting or... or uh, copying uh, Murnau's Nosferatu. No, no. It, it has a strange life of its own. And I can tell because uh, only two hours before uh, this film here started, I saw Murnau's film. I've never seen both films with only an hour time in between. And it's, it has been very, very interesting for me. Mm -hmm. So could you say a little bit too and, and on, on the Jonathan character, which also the ending of the film is yeah. very different than... That he turns yes. in, into a vampire. Mm -hmm. That doesn't exist in uh, Bram Stoker nor in Murnau. Mm -hmm. uh, and he has a, a mission to carry out, and Renfield has a mission, mm -hmm. go north to Riga, and uh, Jonathan Harker rides off into the distance. Um, and they both come out of real estate deals. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's true. true. Yes, yeah, I never thought about that, but it's a good <laughs> observation. Um, yeah, it's, I, I don't know where, where this idea came from, but it, uh, it was there, and it was uh, uh, there with a certain vehemence. And it was clear I would do it no matter what Murnau or Bram Stoker had done before. I couldn't care less. It's also, though, in a way that Jonathan, your Jonathan character, 
there is something. I, watching it, and I also watched, yeah. I've taught both films back to back before too, but it's been a while, and I watched them today yeah. too. But Jonathan, um, at the beginning, he wants to do this real estate deal, and you know, he says because Lucy deserves a better, a yeah. better, a, you know, and and yet where they live seems quite beautiful and comfortable. Sure, but, it's but a no, nice but he, place. Yeah. And she's like, "Don't go, don't go." But you know, he yeah. knows he's going to make make some some buck on this, so he's he's going to go, even mm. though you know Renfield tells him it might cost you a little blood. And so there's something about the ending. I mean, on the one hand, it's that. Um, it seems to me, at least, that I mean, there's some hubris in the Jonathan character here that he doesn't he he he's not satisfied with what he has, um, and goes on this you know it goes on this journey, um, whereas Lucy is the one with I think uh, as I said more agency of her own. Um, I'm thinking of the scene where you know and then of course Nosferatu is um, you know death isn't the worst. Worse is the life lived in dullness and daily futility. Without love, the absence of love is the most abject pain. So I mean, there's a, the, a life not lived, you know, which mm -hmm. Jonathan, the real estate broke, well, the life not lived. Yeah. But that, that can never be banished from human experience. So the vampire can't die with, with the stake, or mm -hmm. you, the ending isn't definitive. It, it, it's a, it continues. And yeah. it isn't simply evil <laughs> in the world. See, uh, but but you're you are doing something which is uh, totally foreign to me, character analysis. I do not do it, mm. I don't do it while I write, write a screenplay, nor when I shoot the film, nor when I edit the film, nor when I watch the film. Right. So it's completely foreign and it's, it's something that you find in, in Hollywood screenwriting seminars, uh, this dull uh, three-act uh, insipid uh, structure of, of a screenplay, completely nonsense, complete, uh, complete stupidity, uh, which, shouldn't, uh, which shouldn't be uh, taken seriously. And, and of course, character development and story development. I've never developed a story, I just write it and I see a, a film uh, as if you were seeing it uh, on a screen. So when I write a screenplay, I write it very, very fast because I see an entire film. There's no character uh, analysis or nothing like that. And I think it's a danger of, of uh, Hollywood screenwriting and it, it's a danger of academia. Well, I'll take that danger. I'll take that dangerous route. I've been traveling in about three decades, but I, I really, it, to me, it's the way that your that your Nosferatu really, in interesting ways, rewrites the vampire myth. Even though there's all kinds of vampire films with a more profound, there's something more profound that you're, that the the changes that you made, and it, uh, and and in whatever yeah. conscious or unconscious way, I just wanted to remark on that. Yeah, I think. Uh when, when I saw uh, Max Schreck, who is really formidable and uh, kind of scary, and uh, an hour later I see Kinski yeah. on the screen, and I think there was never a vampire of his caliber. And I think it will take a, a, a century until we get another vampire of, of, his, yeah. of his magnitude and of his strangeness and intensity. Mm -hmm. There's been nobody, when you look back at all the vampire films, uh, none of them, none of them comes even close to Kinski. Mm -hmm, I agree. So may his poor soul rest in peace. Uh, he has given us something that is totally unique. Mm -hmm, I agree. Well, I'm sure that there are members of the audience who have questions. Oh, thank you, Werner. Um, and your career has been incredible, so we're all blessed. A uh, question for you. I thought the casting of Isabel Ajani as Lucy was uh, brilliant. Can you talk about what it was like working with her on the set and what her experiences were like? Uh, well, Isabel Ajani, I, I wanted her uh, for the film because I had the feeling she was uh, the perfect an antagonist for the vampire, somebody really uh, with a powerful presence on the screen and of course great beauty. Uh, and because of her, it was easier to deal with the French because the uh, French were delighted that there was a French actress in it. 
but um, I think she she has uh, an enormous presence um, and radiation on on the screen. However, <coughs> to work with her always uh, required a lot of attention, more attention uh, sometimes than even Kinski, because she. Um, at that time, and I don't know, I, I heard about other films as well, uh, has always been extremely insecure. Mm -hmm. I mean, so insecure that she wouldn't uh, want to step in front of a cam camera. So my, my role was to, to calm her down, give her complete reassurance. And uh, for example, when before she was uh, in front of the camera, I would also always uh, tell her, uh, can you hold still for, for a moment? I would step very close and, and she would see that I would scan her face very, very carefully, very quickly and carefully, carefully and I would say, beautiful, beautiful, this is really beautiful. And I would ask, may I touch your hair? And she would say, yes, of course. And I would uh, just move a strand of hair out of her forehead. And she knew I, I was really looking uh, after her and, and wanted to make her look at her best and be at her best. Uh, and very often, uh, what was interesting, she needed, and Kinski, by the way, also needed uh, the kind of uh, intonation, the voice. Uh, and, and I always do it in feature films, sometimes even in documentaries. It's when an orchestra is tuning uh, and everybody is following, I think the, uh, uh, the oboe is, is giving chamber tone A and all the other instruments are tuning in. I, I, I say to Kinski, Klaus, uh, give me the first line and I say, oh, this is way too loud. Low, 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 low. Uh, and uh, and I, I would find the right intonation, the right, not just the pitch, it's uh, something much deeper inside. And I would ask Isabel, and, and I said, don't worry if I, uh, if I come back to you right away and say, no, 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 uh, give it to me again, but take your time, take your, when you answer, take your time, 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 and then you say it. And say it with a, with a quiet, quiet emphasis. Let me hear that one sentence. And I said, fine, so uh, beautiful, and I would do, you see, I'm the last one who, uh, would move out between the actors on one side and the technical apparatus on the other side. That's why, as a, as a director, and you normally do not see it, uh, I do this late. I would be very close to them and I would do this in the last moment. And I could tell, I could tell she knows her dialogue, she's right, she finds herself quite fine and good and strong and beautiful. And, and still I had the feeling it's a little too early and I procrastinate and then I would do the slate and move out. So um, it's a lot, a lot of attention and uh, knowing the heart of men, or in this case, knowing the heart of a woman. Uh, and it's a very, a, a very professional attitude that I, that I have all the way into documentary films. But uh, a very, very fine collaboration with her. I was wondering if you could talk about the use of Wagner and uh, you know the, the sort of the two grand use of uh, Wagner. Wagner and the big, two big myths, you know, the Ring myth and the Dracula myth, and perhaps your thoughts about these two combined. Uh, yes, there is uh, Rheingold, uh, a, a piece of Rheingold by Richard Wagner. In it, uh, <clears throat> and it's very strange because Wagner was a very late discovery of mine. I uh, was completely disconnected from music between uh, 13 and 18. For five years, no music whatsoever for me. I blocked myself away from it, like almost like an autistic child. And the reason was a little school tragedy that happened often to all of us. Uh, a uh, music teacher forced me to sing in front of the class and uh, I wouldn't do it and I refused and I held out for almost an hour 
and insulted him and, and the uh, headmaster had to be called and they were debating whether I should be thrown out of school altogether and they held the class hostage. They wouldn't let them out into intermission until I sang. So it was really, really dirty. That was awful. I still feel the pain in me of that moment when I sang. And I knew I would never sing again in my life. Never, ever. Which uh, is true with the exception of completely out of tune, happy birthday once in a while. <laughs> uh, and uh, until today I cannot read music scores. But I have staged operas. I have staged operas and I can't even read the music scores, but I'm very good in hearing. And I would uh, uh, stage it completely absorbing the music and doing an opera is the transformation uh, of the world into music. That's the essence of opera. And uh, so I had, to, uh, I had to grow into it. And uh, when I was out of school, there was this enormous void and vacuum of not having heard uh, music and not having engaged myself. And so I, I went on my own voyage, much of it early in the beginning, very early music. Uh, Heinrich Schütz, uh, Carissimi, uh, uh, Bach and others, and even earlier ones. And then back to quite modern composers, of course, uh, Beethoven. And the very last I discovered, uh, or one of the very last, Wagner. It's very odd how labyrinthic my uh, approach into music was. And uh, of course with uh, Florian Fricke, uh, a very lively sort of exchange about music. And he uh, would play things for me on the piano and, and, and uh, uh, tell me, listen, listen to this one. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then after he played, let's say, some Chopin for me, he said, I, I really played that well. Where is, the, where is anyone else who plays it as well like me? And, and we, we loved these moments. There was always deep substance about it, but there's no deeper meaning about, uh, uh, about uh, incorporating Wagner music in the film. You see, it would be, uh, it would be too far-fetched to read something of uh, a looming darkness and the approach of the Nazi time and Wagner, who was in a way um, a stepping stone, or a, a cultural sort of lead into um, into some some aspects. You see, we, we cannot make uh, Wagner culpable for uh, for Hitler, nor can we make uh, uh, Marx culpable for Stalin. That would be too far fetched. But I I have been asked about use of Wagner in a film like this, and and there's no uh, abs for me absolutely no ideology in this. This one, go on. Back there, yeah. The, the journey that happens in making a film uh, is quite often the point of a project. No, and no, 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 no. <laughs> it's the most unimportant of all. The only thing that counts is what you see on the screen. You see, uh, exploring your boundaries, what, what a stupidity is that. And, and you see it among these extreme mountain climbers and the, the triple triathlon and all this nonsense that you see around. You see it on television, you see them in talk shows. I'm not one of those. I'm not one of those. I'm just a quiet soldier of cinema. Okay. So... <laughs> yeah. I'm so, sorry for interrupting you. No problem. <laughs> in, a, in, in some of your experiences, though, in making films, uh, the backstory is some of the most interesting aspects. Uh, for example, no, Fitzcarraldo. Yeah. I think you had mentioned at some point life-threatening situations for some folks. So what? Can you, can you tell us about some of your most memorable experiences uh, that didn't make it on the screen? Well, there's quite, quite a few uh, very memorable instances. Birth of my children, for example, shouldn't be on film. It shouldn't be even on photos. 
I, I find it very odd that friends of mine reported to me full of, of ecstasy, I filmed the birth of my daughter. <laughs> I find it wrong for, for, the, for some of the very essential things. You should never even contemplate to take a photo or delegating the experience or delegating uh, the memory to, uh, let's say, movie or celluloid or video. And you can see it now, I saw something very remarkable, a real paradigm of, of things. Uh, a photo of uh, a packed line of people and Pope Francis is coming along and, and blessing them. And almost everyone, all the young people, are turned with their backs to the Pope and with a selfie stick, <laughs> and they are taking themselves in the Pope. They never saw the Pope because the Pope passes by. They eventually see him from behind. But what I'm trying to say is the delegating the experience, and I mean, it would have been a meaningless encounter anyway. Number one, what does it mean for anyone to see the Pope walking by and blessing you? Uh, it's probably not, not that important. But um, uh, why, uh, why do, uh, does, uh, uh, in particular, the, the very young generation delegate more and more and more of quasi life experiences to, to filming or celluloid, or, or celluloid not anymore, but to video and selfies and things like that. So the, the experiences that I have, in, in a way, some of it are described like Fitzcarraldo. There's a book uh, that I wrote, where I wrote um, diaries at the time of uh, uh, the, the filming. And uh, I published it uh, 27 years later. It's real good prose, and, and it, you, you do not find prose of that caliber very often. <laughs> so uh, I, it, but, but this is not delegating memories. Actually, I, I wrote it because there was such immense pressure on me and one catastrophe after the other. And when I say catastrophe, I mean real catastrophes. Two plane crashes, small aircraft, uh, the camp that I built for 1,100 people, uh, and I got into, a, uh, into the middle of a border war that broke out between Peru and Ecuador, and my camp was attacked and burned to the ground. And the leading character becomes ill after half uh, the filming and has to be sent to the United States, and his doctors wouldn't allow him to uh, return. And I had uh, Mick Jagger also in the film, who was phenomenally good. And I, when I, I had to start all over again, so real catastrophes. And they do not count. The only thing is what, what you see there. They are, in, in a way, scribbled down. And of course, much of what's in the book is also fever dreams in the jungle, uh, inventing, inventing disasters, describing them, naming them, because by dint of naming them, I knew they wouldn't occur. Uh, so it's a very strange form of, of writing prose. Um, and delegating, delegating, let's say, the occurrence of any further catastrophe that I imagined uh, made a lot of sense. Um, this is a little more of a personal question. Yeah. You mentioned some challenges you face, uh, picking locks, faking permits, the plastic kind of style. My question is, when you as a director or as an artist, when you are faced with some of these adversities, how do you really overcome it like in the Werner Herzog style? Is it like the, the fearless look or just, you know, this unabashedful direction? Well, mm -hmm. well there is no, no general rule. Your, <coughs> uh, cinema is complicated. Uh, when you are a sculptor, you are chiseling away from one block of, of marble and that's your obstacle. But in filmmaking, there's a, a lot of things, financing and technical side and actors and uh, editing and writing and uh, 
distribution system. So and all of it is very vulnerable. So you have to brace yourself for for everything that's thinkable, even for the unthinkable. You better brace yourself. And for young filmmakers, I, I keep saying, um, gain enough uh, understanding of the world uh, and don't be afraid to go to the borderlines of legality sometimes as you have a natural right to do a film. If you have a real fine project, uh, you, you have a certain natural right that is impeded and obstructed by bureaucracy, for example. And you do things, or I would do things that may be illegal, but I do things, only things that do not hurt anyone. You see, that's a key. You have to find your ethical borderline. And I always, very, very often I hear, I uh, heard so must be a man who doesn't know, take no for an answer, wrong wrong. When I see that something is not doable, I, I would immediately uh, reconsider, find a solution that would be even an imaginative, imaginative, um, imaginary solution that would be even better than what was scripted and uh, preconceived as an idea. Um, <clears throat> there are many, many examples, but uh, a very good example I did uh, films on death row in Texas and in a few, two cases in Florida. <clears throat> and there's a very clear protocol. You have to write to the inmate uh, and he or she has to invite you and then next step is the warden has to agree. And if it's complicated cases, all the way up to the governor of the state who could deny or allow you to do this. And in one case, uh, I was ready to travel uh, next day or so with a small crew and equipment to, to Texas. Uh, the inmate was totally fine to talk to me on camera and I get an email from his attorney who says to me, I do not have the power to uh, talk my client out of filming with you, but I have to tell you, he, we, number one, we have an ongoing last appeal. And second, my client has a tendency to say stupid, damaging things uh, on camera. Could you please reconsider? Do you know what? 20 seconds later, I, I wrote back one half sentence. Shooting is cancelled, period. That was that. So uh, you, you have to find, uh, you have to find a, a, a balance. What, what is a no? and what is a soft no and what is a no uh, that comes out of stupidity. Or, you see, there's a lot, a lot of what I call institutionalized cowardice. <laughs> and you have it, you have it in the uh, E&O insurances that dominate uh, much of uh, what is going on in finances, in filmmaking. You have completion bonds. And, and this is nothing but institutionalized cowardice. They try to avoid that they ever, ever, ever have to step in to uh, be legally obliged to finish your film financially if somehow things go completely awry and end somehow in a, in a fiasco, in a financial or organizational fiasco. So <clears throat> you have to be smarter than them and you have to, to exercise your natural right of fraud uh, criminal energy, uh, whatever is in the book, theft, you just do it. Uh, but, as I said, uh, with a necessary framework of, uh, uh, of ethical behavior. It's not unethical if you steal a camera. From if, you, if you take a camera from a, there's 25 cameras in your bank, in your local bank, if, if you are managing to disguise yourself as a camera repair man and you, you take the best of them and you use it for making a film, fine. Number one, <laughs> they have 24 cameras left. And number two, in the next 20 years, no bank robber is, is coming anyway. So uh, you, you, you have to, 
you have to find the right balance and you have to, uh, you have, to have a, a certain amount of street wisdom a part of what drives you to make a certain film, what drives you to, to write a screenplay, to adopt a story, to uh, start shooting with, uh, with actors. So um, you, just, uh, you just do it and of course there uh, are film, young filmmakers, film students here. Best of luck to all of you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.